folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace Hive of 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And, uh, it's a high honor to bring in a, a gifted rhythmist, a cat who I'm guessing, t I'm just on a hunch thinking that he came up playing music that he wanted to touch people's hearts and feel good as opposed to becoming famous and uh, f having a, amassing a huge fortune, which is uh, what has happened today in today's pop music paradigm. Anytime he gets close to the pop realm, uh, he veers away from that to play holistic improvisational music that hopefully will help him get off and then therefore uh, raise the collective consciousness of the audience and then get back to the band. He does that with Soul Live and he does that with all sorts of different uh, iterations of bands. Um, and they've uh, been able to find a touring model, uh, that uh, a sophisticated touring model in an age when the touring circuit, especially in this country, has in some ways disappeared. Looking forward to getting down. Alan Evans, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you very much for having me. That's uh, quite the introduction there. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it was, just, it was just right off the top of my head. Um, I, you right. know, I just I wanted to get a, just before we get into things, I, that, group, that clip we came in with was the first time I actually saw you live, which was back in November at the Brooklyn Bowl with the uh, Everyone Orchestra with uh, with Karina Reichman. And I just wanted you to talk. Yeah. Did you enjoy playing with Karina? Because uh, it, it was it was fun to see that. Oh, yeah, man. She's great. That's actually, um, yeah, that was like that weekend that we played. That was the first time I ever played with her. Um, you know, I hung out with her a bit before. and um, But uh, she's awesome. I mean, that was like... Um, She's such a, a super musical uh, individual, you know. Um, just like, and that's and I, that's the kind of uh, uh, people I like playing with. Um, she's just ah, oh, she's just in it to to be. It's just music. It's just music, music, music. Right. Um, I mean, when you say that, you mean like no, there are no labels, and it's just. Can you explain? that definition of, of, of musical in the, in the Alan Evans sense? Well, you know, it's, it's, um, well, I guess <clears throat> speaking in terms of just playing with Karina and I guess just anybody else I really dig playing with, it's like the people who, who are like sponges, they soak up everything that's <laughs> around them. Right. And then, and then it's, uh, and then output it in, in with their own, voice they turn everything that they they soak up in it and, and it becomes their voice rather than um i, I guess co you know copying or trying to to sound exactly like so-and-so or this kind of style um that's uh, that's cool there's, there's nothing wrong with that you know a lot of people do that but that's just not my vibe uh, um, so and that was the perfect example of playing with karina like and it was and it was it was a lot of fun when we were traveling around that weekend as well just like really getting to know her and well everybody uh and who was in the group that weekend but especially her and where you know so many influences and the, the crazy thing you, you know you're hanging out talking she brings up all these different musical references from from either today or a long time ago and just like and then i keep i i would forget how old she was right i mean she's yeah. She's uh, it's and ridiculous. So that, I mean, yeah, yeah. But she is. She. I mean, she's always been sort of an outlier. I, I've never. Uh, right. You know. I mean, she. You know, coming from the Upper West Side of New York, you know, she didn't want to be a. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to be a wanker. She didn't want to be like some. Yeah. Jazzer. You know, she was interested in like, you know, doing stuff, uh, burning music. Just it's all music. Yeah. But I, you know, the reason exactly. I bring, I just want to ask you this question because I've done a couple interviews with Stanley Clark, and he goes, you know, Jake mm -hmm. the. The real people that increase musical vocabulary on the bandstand are the rhythm sections. A lot of cats don't realize that. And okay. and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about um, your philosophy as it relates to the rhythm section. I, I've been getting off on this thing lately where, um, you know, a lot of younger cats that are lead guitar players that came up, but you know, 
obviously when before our time to a degree mm -hmm. uh guitar players were playing rhythm i mean you listen to freddie green yeah. okay they, they were playing hypnotic it was a rhythm instrument then when the saxophone took a back seat to the guitar as a solo instrument all of a sudden cats like my generation and gen xer younger they came up you know only soloing on the guitar so sometimes right, when right. i hear uh improvisational music like the everyone orchestra i hear it sort of I hear it reach a, pen, a, a, a certain tension and release, but there's something lacking and, and something that relates to the rhythm guitar. Now, that being said, I'm throwing a lot at you here. I just want you no, to talk. I got you. Yeah, but can you talk about, the, I mean, when, he, when Stanley was talking about him and Tony Williams or Ron Carter and Tony Williams and, you know, Billy Cobham and Rick, mm -hmm. all those cats that, ex, that expanded musical vocabulary on the bandstand and i just wanted you to talk about uh your philosophy as it relates to that okay well i mean it, i guess my my philosophy on that starts off pretty uh simply uh listen listening it's all about listening um uh listening to everyone who's on stage with you li and and just listening to music now the thing is um <clears throat> when i was younger um and i've, I've told this to friends and, and other people, whatever, and I'll tell you, when I was younger, when Neil and I were younger, we were, my father, um, I'm talking, we would be three, four years old, five years old, whatever, and we would walk through, there was a living room where he had all his music, you know, stereo and albums and everything, and, and, and on the other side of the living room, we had was the, what we called the TV room. So we wanted to go watch cartoons or whatever. He had to walk through the living room, get to the TV room. Mm -hmm. Now, my father, if he was in there listening to music, you're like, oh, man, we got to go through there <laughs> just because of this. <laughs> my father would, we'd walk through and he'd stop. He'd stop us. He'd say, hey, come here. Uh, who's playing alto saxophone? Who's playing tenor? Who's playing piano? Who's playing bass? <laughs> now, in this, I'm talking, we were young, four or five years old. And this, um, I'm so grateful for that experience because it got us to listen to to the um the recording or the performance as a whole you got to know people's tone their their phrasing um exactly the, the personality so with that said so with me coming up i never really um saw myself as a drummer i'm just a musician i play other instruments you know and but my I, I always felt that my biggest um, gift or uh, uh, or what I bring to us uh, any stage is my ability to listen and understand what other people are are doing on stage. So that you know, um, and and I feel that a lot of times that's that's kind of lost. Now you bring up guitars, for instance. One of my favorite gu guitars of all time. Most people will know this is Jimi Hendrix. Now, Jimi Hendrix, of course, is known for, you know, all the, the albums, his albums as the experience, band, band of Gypsies, blah, blah, blah. But what a lot of people, well, most people know, but maybe most people don't understand the importance of his experience as a rhythm guitar. Exactly. A exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Jimi Hendrix was one of the baddest rhythm guitars you'll ever hear in your life. And, and, but, and, but the, the problem is a lot of the young, younger generation have, you know, will go, oh, well, I want to be a lead guitar because it's, it's, it's the flashy part of it. You know, it's the sexy part of, of, of that instrument or, or being on stage. So they focus in on that. And a lot of some focus on rhythm. Another perfect example, Jaco Pastorius, obviously one of the greatest bass players of all time. But again, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, they, they, they're familiar with Jocko as a fusion player, a jazz, you know, bass player. Sure. But they don't dig deep enough and understand his roots as an R&B bass player. Now, if you really listen, dig in and listen to even the Weather Report album, Jocko Pastorius, that dude, he could lay down a, a bass line for, you know, five minutes long and would not deviate from that line. And just over and over, drive it into your head. You know, I mean, drive it into your into your soul. Again, this is you know, but people don't really take the. I feel a lot of times, um, 
certain musicians, younger or old, old or whatever, don't really spend the time focusing on that, the rhythmic aspect of, of, of what's going down. You know, they just choose a pro- – but, of course, like, you know, you get a lot of young bass players who want to be Jocko, and they're just soloing all over the place. They grab his tone and, 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 and certain, you know, phrasing from soloing. But it's like, man, focus – like, check out his – what he's doing with the rhythm section, you know? And uh, – so anyway, I you know I, I feel that that's the, the start of my philosophy. It's just listen, you know. And I, I, I in terms of drum, um, you know, a lot of cats will come. Out, I, I don't give a lot of drum lessons, but people will ask me, you know, about drums, you know, and like talking drums, drum, drums. I'm like, that's cool, you know. But I, I tell a lot of cats, and I, I you can you can always tell the cats who are just like in the practice room for seven eight hours and they're just playing all these you know the stuff these rhythms and licks and whatever and they get on stage and they're just you know playing those and not listening what what does it relate to what that, is anything that's going on stage maybe not but what I always suggest to people is look you know you don't have to be um, uh, proficient at it but pick up another instrument. You know, if you're in a band with, you know, just pick up any play. Go over to the piano, try and play. Go over, pick up a guitar, pick up a bass, pick up a flute, whatever it may be, and try and play that instrument. And the more you do that, the more you're. I, I believe that you're going to be in tune with what's going on on stage, or you know, whatever in the rehearsal room or on stage with other musicians. It's going to force you to listen. In a, in, a, in a different way than just listening to yourself. And then beyond that, what I always, uh, what I tell people, it's all about the song. To me, my purpose is not up there to, to be showy or what, or what I'm there to make people feel good and play and, and do the song justice. It's all about the song to me. Um, again, that goes back to listening, you know? Yeah, well, no, that's, um, I mean, that's the, the, the key is if you're going to, because I've seen you talk about, uh, you know, picking up, I mean, picking up a different instrument or multi-instruments. I mean, like, I was just transcribing my interview with Raul Matute, who was, you know, was the keyboardist with Cold Blood, among other things, and he's talking mm-hmm. about, like, I mean, he's talking about, like, pre-Sons of Champlin playing, like, casual gigs yeah. with Bill Champlin. And, and you know, Champlin's playing bass and Raul's playing mm-hmm. drums. I mean, you know, yeah. th- I mean, yeah. th- that was a given back in the day. But I actually, I, mm-hmm. you know, you queued something up about the living room and the television room. I got an audio sound by, we got a name on, a game on this program called Name That Voice. I want you to take a listen to this uh, and the content and then we'll uh, we'll come back and break it down. Uh, I wanted to open our minds up to, you know, to, to the rest of life instead of just this American way. And uh, they want to, wanted to include it since we were here, since we are here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wanted to, they, they wanted us to have a broader perspective of uh, what we were involved with and who we are. And so, by collecting all this music over time, over time, over time, really the way it it sunk in was that we just started gravitating to his records. They were lined up on the wall, lots of vinyl, vinyl at the time, no CDs, no, no tapes, no digital files. It was old school. It was uh, album covers, which really was part of the attraction. And then, uh, we heard the music and, and, uh, or, or or many times the other way around. Um, there was um, all kinds of music that he collected. I mean, from Fela Kute to the Impressions to, uh, to Beethoven to the Rite of Spring, back to John Coltrane, and then we were bringing in Cool and the Gang and I mean, I mean, it was, was a smorgasbord. Kinds, this is unbelievable. That is, all kinds full, of music. All, you have any idea who that is? That's my brother Kofi. Dude, listen to you. Look at the ear. Talk about listening. You got huge ears, man. That's Kofi. Oh, Bur- that's Kofi, my <laughs> man, from uh, September of last year. And this is what I want you to talk about because you you already touched on it with um with your pops. 
I mean, Kofi, I was talking to him about just the roots. I mean, here's this cat who was playing with Donald Byrd at Howard University uh, as a kid. But the roots mm-hmm. of, of, the, of, the, of the music of, the, of, of, of your people that goes back and traces back to the, the beginnings of this country and back to di- di- diaspora and, and all that stuff. And he really talked about the, the adherence and the education that his father dr- got into O'Teal and him, which was it was mm-hmm. it was a large collection of black music, and so I wanted you to even though he your dad would come in and say who's playing alto, who's playing drums, it was more about to me. I mean that's music I live and die with to a degree, and I say to myself mm-hmm. that music, Dolphy's music, and Julian Priester's music, and all the cats that I've interviewed. That was the the cry of and the history of African American voice, and I wanted you mm-hmm. to talk about that because the impact that it had on you. Because I've seen you in situ or I've read about uh, certain situations where maybe you link up with a with sort of a rap artist or something. And you guys do it, and you cook the groove for a, a few weeks on tour. But then you're like, you know, that was cool, but I just want to go back to music that touches my heart and feels good away from the pop Mm -hmm. more towards authenticity you can riff on that any way you want but Kofi was just talking about how his dad and mom really instilled that culture in them yeah 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 I mean honestly man it's you know that's exactly why when Neil and Kofi and O'Keele and I get together and play music is it's um we don't have to talk about anything. <laughs> we don't have to even look at each other on stage. We're all on the same page. I mean, um, and so, you know, growing, yeah, definitely growing up. Um, I mean, Kofi basically took all the words out of, out of my mouth, really. I mean, it's, it's a very similar situation. Um, well, let, just, you know, uh, you know, let me let me ask you something better. First of all, if you could talk about sure. uh, the nonverbal communication on the bandstand, this is extremely important for younger cats because we live in a very verbal time, and there's a lot mm-hmm. of micromanaging. So, explain. Like, I was interviewing David T. Walker a, 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 mm-hmm. a, a few minutes ago, uh, like a, a few months ago, and he was like, he talked about Gene Page, who was the arranger for Barry White, would come in. And it was Wilton Felder and Ed Green and, and yeah. David T, right? And, and there'd be no yeah. – he would just come in with some chord changes and maybe he'd mm-hmm. tell Ed, like, or, you know, like, like give this song a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a rock feel or like a – you know, but it would just be – that was it. How, and so can you talk about how you can create emotional transcendent music and not say a word to each other going into it? Uh, well, one one thing is is tr- is trust, trusting that uh, everyone that you're playing with on stage um, is, I guess, in a way coming from the same place as you are. Now we may we all may have different. Uh, we've gotten to that point with different musical influences, but the overall the overall influence I guess would be the same. The overall language is the same and that's you know and that's what it is that was you know it's a language we're um so we've grown up if we're um paying attention and and um and uh listening to and uh, absorbing the same kind of influences then if you trust everyone that's on stage with you that they're they're on the same page you don't have to talk about anything you know i mean you don't have to say anything um it's uh at the at uh heartbeat you can move switch directions and everyone's like oh that i know you know i know where he's going and i'm going there as well or i want to take it here so and and i know they're all going to follow me and that's the that's the biggest thing with soul odd well a lot of cats i've you know i play with but especially obviously soul odd there's a lot of trust in in that we're we're all there doing this doing the right thing doing the same thing um because we have those very similar influences um, that we came up with and that are, are to this day still influencing us, you know. Um, the funny thing is, is you know, you, you talk about when we had like this new record and we came into the studio beforehand, we didn't talk about what we wanted to do or um, uh, what we wanted it to sound like or anything like that. It was just we sat down, we started playing, and, and it just 
and it became what it became. And we were all on the, and we were all on the same page about it. Um, again, going back to we just, you know, trust each other. I think a lot of it is just, it is, it is trust. Right. I mean, uh, did you, you grew up in Buffalo, is that right? I did. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, can you talk about a time when, you know, there maybe that it was just it, it, there was more of a push and pull. It was outside. It, it was the, a lack of trust. I just want to. I want people to really mm-hmm. understand the difference between uh, nonverbal communication and love on the bandstand versus pushing and pulling and the drag. Some some people don't. Some people get up there like you said. They've been wood shedding for eight hours a day. Yeah. And they're just playing, they're playing facility and you're just staring at the wall, you know? So I'm just trying to get that. Was there a moment when, when you really, when there was just like, that's not, that's not trust. Um, hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and you don't have to mention names or anything, but I mean like, you know, this is good. No. For, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's kind of funny. I guess I'm in a, a very, um, unique situation in that I've been uh, I started playing music when I was very 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 young very young like I started playing drums when I was like nine months old you know like that's inc- that's you, know, you were able to sit upright you were what you were on the on the on the kid at nine uh, yeah something like that yeah I mean, <laughs> like, like two yeah I mean like they're they were just around you know what I mean um, and uh and Neil the same. Neil started off as a drummer, um, but Neil and I have always been played music together. So um, I guess before we understood that we had that trust, even before we understood what it actually was. So with that said, when I, pretty much whenever Neil and I would would play with somebody else, it was like, oh, okay, we got to you know get them on, uh, you know, <laughs> right. we're definitely not on the same page, right, you know? right, and it, right. And it, 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 it took a while, you know, it took a while until you, we were able to play with, uh, and luckily we, we were lucky enough that, but, you know, I started gigging out in Buffalo when I was like 11 or something like that. Um, I love this. Playing, I love this. And playing with me, real musicians, like, you know, we weren't like, we were out, you know, I, I, back then I wanted to be a jazz drummer, you know, so I, I was going to play jazz with older cats, cats who were like in their forties, fifties, you know? And, uh, and you would, they would let you know really fast if you were, you know, if <laughs> what you were doing wrong, you know. Um, and, and again, and, and not about what you're doing wrong, but about listening, you know. Like, I remember I remember this one time I went down to this place called the, it was the, uh, the what, what's it called in Buffalo? It was the Pine, Gr- the Pine uh, Grill? Well, no, no, it was the Black Musician uh, local. Wow. Was that, wait, the black, a, U, black musicians union was still active in the eighties when you were there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, oh. yeah. So I, I remember one time I went down there and I was feeling pretty good about myself. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm grooving, I'm grooving up there with these cats and then I get a, then they give me a solo. Right. So my <laughs> idea, so what I'd been really digging on at, at that point was Coltrane. You know, mm-hmm. so, um, you know, a later Coltrane. So, you know, I'm singing Elvin Jones. I'm going to take it out. You know, I got my, you know, but we were playing. I don't even remember what tune we were playing. <laughs> so I started going for it. And what I didn't realize is that these cats are like, like I was supposed to be following the form of the song. Right. You know what I mean? Right, like right, changes. right. I had no, so these <laughs> dudes are like wait, looking at me like, I, you know, waiting to come back in, I had no idea what I was doing at all, you know. And so afterwards, you know, Kevin told me, like, well, you know, you got to, you know, you got to follow the changes, you know. Like, and I was supposed to, again, going back to listening. These cats aren't playing, but there's still a form, you know what I mean, whether it be a blues or whatever it was. And I was supposed to take one or two courses of a solo like everybody else did, but, you know. Um, so again, you know, I learned then that I was, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't being, I wasn't really participating in what was going. I was in my own space, you know what I mean? And but I learned quickly um, to 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 listen. And and again, you know, when you get on certain gigs and 
you just know that, you know, certain cats just aren't, 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 aren't there with you. They're not there yet, or they're just not there with you. Um, so, I mean, yeah, do, I, I mean, I do, you, do you, like, with the, with, like, what do you feel, I mean, even though you're not exactly an elder, I mean, I've, I've, ta- I've done five mm-hmm. interviews with Billy Cobham and Tootie Heath and, yeah. you know, I mean, all these legendary elders. And, and I just wonder at this mm-hmm. point, do you, uh, you know, it could be the Everyone Orchestra or it could be just younger cats. Like what, how do you um, help them? How do you help their ears grow on the bandstand? How do you mentor younger cats? Because we got a lot of situations now where, you um, you know, music is listened to in isolation. Mm-hmm. You hear a lot, see people yeah. with headphones on, you know, not a lot of communal stuff. Like when you, I mean, I just sort of had this vision that you and Kofi and, and O'Teal and your brother mm-hmm. were like, you know, it, it, like eight hours a day in D.C., but I mean, you were in Buffalo, so that wasn't really possible. Right. But, but I mean, that, that sort of communal musical thing is still there, but because of, yeah. of, of technology, not so much. So how do you... um how do you mentor on the bandstand uh, in 2018? Well, it's interesting. That, in 2018, I don't think it's any different from when, like, in my situation when I went to the, you know, down on that gig or or back in 1942 or, you know what I mean? Like, I don't <laughs> think anything land, has yeah. really changed. Exactly. You know what I mean? The thing is, like, not, it's really funny that it, now I, I, I'm, I'm just having a better understanding. So the, the, how I mentor people on, when I'm on, on, on stage is just being myself now and, and letting my experience speak for itself. And, and people, if, if, if you're, if you have a half a brain in your head, you're going to under, you, you get to know pretty quick who, who has experience on stage and what it's worth. Um, and I, again, I still have a long way to go, obviously, but um, it, it's one thing when uh, me speaking, say if I'm uh, on the gig as a drummer, now, someone may come to, to come to the stage and play with me who's used to us, you know, cats that they're playing with, you know right. what I mean? And, and it's just kind of loose. There's a difference when someone plays with me, you know what I mean? Like, they again, going back to listening, when, you know, someone's over here just playing, and, and I hear everything that's going on in stage. So if I'm, if I'm jumping on, on, on a lick that you're playing or, you know, a style or whatever, you know, that grabs people's attention. Like, oh, shoot, this dude is actually, he's listening. He's not playing through what I'm doing or, you know, not paying attention. So that can help people like, oh, well, if he's listening, like, I better be on my game. You know what I mean? Like, um, or, and again, uh, with me, like, controlling, controlling the, I, I, I really like the control, or I wouldn't say control, but, you know, tempo, you know, like, putting... Uh, a certain emphasis into the groove, you know, into the music um, is something I'm just really good at. I've learned to be really good at. Um, and, and people who aren't used to that kind of drummer, they, they always, they always comment on it. You know, there's just a certain fire I come with a certain intensity that, um, and it doesn't mean I'm, it has, that doesn't mean it's loud or sometimes it is loud, but it's just, I, I mean, every, Every note that I play, I mean. Um, I love it. No, I want to be clear, though. I, this is important. Are, so instead of just keeping time, you're playing the song and you're playing melodically. Is that, I mean. And, oh, yeah. Okay. And, 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 and so for other cats who are not used to that, they'll come up to you and say, wow, man, uh, I'm not used mm-hmm. to that or that was pretty hip or, I mean, what, what, what kind? Yeah. I mean, so. The, yeah, people, people. Say say that and I wish my drummer played like that. Or whatever you know, like I mean, I mean, and it, you know, again, I'm not. I'm no, not no, 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 no. This just comes with experience. You know, I mean, this is something I didn't always have, and now I I do. And 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 in ten years we'll try talk again or whatever. You know, and I'll have learned something else that I'll catch who already learned. You know, it's a it's a it's a constant growing uh, process experience. You know. But I know what that 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 can help, um, you know, somebody somebody uh, younger, you know, uh, because I, again, I've been in that situation. I know what it's like. I remember I was 16 years old, and uh, my band in Buffalo had an opportunity to open up for Maceo Parker, 
It was about, well, I was about 16, I guess, and that was when Life on Planet Groove came out. Right. I don't remember the exact year, but it was somewhere around there. And um, uh, Maceo had an open, so there were two opening bands. Well, there was uh, my band, and then in, and Maceo was playing two sets. So that's Fred, Pee Wee, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, those dudes, man. Um, so, I mean, they, 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 those guys were fighting for five hours about who was going to play which repertoire. It was insane, that group. Right, right, exactly. So what happened was, was uh, so um, <laughs> this, is how, this is how young and dumb I was, okay? So I knew the, 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 the Like on Planet Groove album because that was Ken with Denar playing drums, right? So we get to the show, we, you know, we couldn't load in and, and uh, you know, we check them out. They're playing. I'm like, man, who is this dude playing drums? Man, he's not hitting it. It, it wasn't Kenwood. Kenwood wasn't on the gig. I'm like, man, he's just kind of weak, you know? Like, right. blah, blah, blah. Because I'm feeling good about myself, of course, you know, young and dumb. So somewhere I end up talking. It was um, Pee Wee's son um, who had his band with him, and they were going to play in between – the se- and the set break in between Mayfield's two sets. So it was our band, and Mayfield came on, and then, and then Pee Wee's son, and then Mayfield was going to come back on. So somehow I get talking with, with, um, with Pee Wee's son. I'm like, man, you know, you know we're talking, yeah, we're playing, but I have, you know, my drummer couldn't make it or something like that. So, you know, Mayfield's drummer's going to play with me. I was like, I was, man, no, nah, no, nah, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'll come, so I'll come play with you, Cat, you know. So I go on the tour bus. I learn the tunes real quick. It was like maybe four or five tunes, something like that. Then we get on stage, and I'm like feeling pretty good. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm playing with, you know, Pee Wee's son. And then all of a sudden, Maceo, Fred, and Pee Wee come out on stage. And I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm like, oh, man, these, I'm going to show these cats what's up, you know? <laughs> and I'm playing. And I remember Maceo turned around and gave me this look that was just. Oh goodness! I like it scared me. It's it just it, I was scared. I was scared <laughs> for my life, you know, because I just was not hitting it, you know. Like so, anyway, that 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 passed. And and the funny thing I told I told Fred and I were talking about it years later, and he's, he's laughing about it because he actually remembered it. He didn't realize it was me, but you know, right. so I made an impression on him. That's good. But <laughs> just the funny thing is, so is that look of like. Kid, you're not here. You're not there yet. You know, what I mean, get on board. You know, like you got a lot to learn. Secondly, the drummer who I was dissing was Melvin Parker. Wow, Maceo's brother. Wow. I mean, talk about legendary drummer, right? James Brown. And that's how stupid I was. You know, what I mean, like I, I put my own like my uh, ego or my young, my young, you know in front of like just being there in the moment and really soaking it in and but that's what you do when you're young you know what i mean and and i, I I'm, I'm glad i did it because i've always been that person i was like jump on stage with anybody i don't care you know well and i, I, I mean like, i gotta be honest i mean I, yeah you did get the piercing death stare from maceo and and you know right. But you know what, man? I don't know how you're supposed to learn otherwise unless you have the... I mean, I've been doing my gig for six exactly. years and, and to have the mm-hmm. audacity to, you know, talk to... Uh, you know, you, you just don't start out by getting Stanley Clark on your show and asking about Scientology or Merle Haggard yeah, yeah. about being in the hole at San Quentin. I mean, you have to fall down, make mistakes, or be a fool. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's yep. like... If it's just sort of managing understanding your role and ego as opposed to being dumb. I mean, I just think that you, right. you know, I mean, I mean, whatever, at, at the end of the day, you know, you and Fred were laughing about it, but I mean, you yeah. still walked away. I'm still trying to figure out how did you, so you guys were playing double drums behind them or, or how did that work exactly? Oh, no, no, it was just me on drums. So like, like, no, I just like took over the gig. Oh, okay. So that, <laughs> that's yeah, very Jake yeah, Feinberg ish right like, there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like Melvin literally just came in on that gig like last minute. So like whoever like was going to uh, probably Kenwood was going to play in, in between or whatever, but he wasn't there. And Melvin, you know, he's like, I don't want to learn these tunes. Oh, cool. You got some other, 
as young kids do. Fine. I'm, I'm oh, I did. this is well, I mean, <laughs> this is classic. I mean, first of all, Kenwood Denard is a badass. I mean, dude, that dude oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is f- furious yeah, he's, player. He's a good friend of mine, man. He's, he's yeah, he's 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 killing, man. He's, he's killing he's, it. That's a crazy dude. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, so, but I mean, you're, st- I mean, le- le- I mean, you know, you're Mr. Evans is still. I mean, you still have a way of taking over a gig, but you're doing it in a more soulful fashion now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I guess I, uh, yeah, I've learned, I've, you know, but again, I learned though, you know, I mean, it just takes time, you know, and like, and I guess that's the thing. It's like, it's, you know, for younger cats, it's the ego and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's, and, the, and that's fine. That's good. You need that. You know what I mean? Because, a, a lot of times, because a lot of times your ability just isn't there yet. So you have to, it's great to assert yourself, but this is also like, at you know, after the gig, after the gig, or after you get that dirty look or whatever it is, it's like, you know, just learn from that. You know what I mean? Just, that's the part. And, and again, it just, it just takes time. Nothing, none of this happens overnight. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's a lot of, and because of, the uh, interesting thing is now because of like YouTube and all this kind of stuff, I'm noticing a lot of younger cats who are like really technically proficient, you know what I mean? And like they're, they're coming up a lot faster, you know, because they have access to a lot more information, especially visually, you know what I mean? Like, which we didn't really have much of when I was coming up, but still like, but, um, but there's still a lot to learn, you know what I mean? In terms of, you know, feel and, uh, and, and, and well, just, here's what I want. Knowing. This is this is really important. Talking to Alan Evans here on the Jake Feinberg show, having a ball. Th- this is the, the the is the issue. The the bottom line is you were shedding, and you had a lot of opportunities to play live. So you got comfortable with your own sound. You got comfortable with trust. Is it mm-hmm. is it a supply and demand issue with the younger cats today, or is it the fact that we have? The la- a lack of a, of an audience like has music as its significant has music's significance in our culture changed so that you know because th- I used to think for a long time oh there's not enough clubs and you know the truth is in like in like Los Angeles there's like maybe the one jazz club left and like a lot of the urban center is like you know there's not a mm-hmm. lot of places to play but then the more I got I kind of get around and 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 take the Jake Feinberg show on the road I realize there's a lot of venues but. I'm not sure if there's p- patrons that are willing to to support the music. I, I, that's all I'm getting at is with younger cats. Like, d- is it's different today because you were on the bandstand four or five nights a week for months at a time when you were yeah, younger. Yeah, 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 definitely. But you know, that's the the funny thing is, is like, but uh, yeah, it was definitely different for us. Things have changed. But younger cats, this is what they're coming up knowing, though. So I don't know if it's. Yeah, I mean, I. It's kind of hard to call it a. I mean, if that's all you know, that's what you know. Um, so, I guess the, the I guess really the your question is with. Um, or that's what I'm guessing. What we're trying to get at is, you know, how does how does one? No, I'll tell you what it is. To, Let me because it wasn't a very yeah, yeah. very well sp- spelled out. When you when your dad brought you into the living room and said, "Who's on alto, and who's on this, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, you know who's on drums." Everybody had their own individual sound. Every you could yeah, tell yeah. right away that they had mm-hmm. their own. You have your own individual sound, but that now is yeah. becoming harder and harder to differentiate. You don't know who's playing now because you said there's yeah. a saturation of material out there. So I'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. I'm talking about more the idea of for, you know why is it that we that younger cats are having a harder time finding their own individual voice. That's kind of I hear a lot of comping. I don't hear a lot of individuality. Yeah, I can I can dig that. I I I, I, I um I definitely ask that myself, you know, a lot and I, that's a good question. I mean, that's the you know, when when I was younger, I'm it's so fun. I'm sorry, it's not like old old dude. You're right? an old man. Me oh, too, man. I'm just turning age. 40 this year, so we're old, man. Yeah, but you know, we got yeah, half yeah. our lives ahead of us. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, when when we were young, I remember, like, you know, the, it, it's really it's really interesting. And maybe it was because we didn't have all. That is, 
You're absolutely no, just say it. you did not have the saturation of visual material, no, so no, you were no. aud- you were learning auditorily. It, yeah, yeah, maybe that has something to do with it, I guess. Um, and also, we didn't have as much. I mean, back in the day, like you would save up money, and like maybe if you were lucky, you'd go and buy like two records, you know, or like on <laughs> vinyl or whatever. And but you would like sit there and you would listen to it sit and listen and read the liner notes back and forth back and forth and listen to that album until you could afford the next one you know and now it's like you know like just have you can listen to every song ever recorded like at any moment um ever so much so i don't know but but the funny thing is you would think with that much um information at your fingertips or that much that would help you but i some for i really believe that it's almost a I, I think it's kind of a hindrance in a way. And, and it's as strange as that may sound, you know, the, no, it, no, you're um, absolutely right. Because I guess, you know, less yeah. is more. <laughs> well, no, well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it's, 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 first of all, it, there's such a, we're, we're flooded with so much that unless you're a deep seeker or you have compadres like Alan Evans or people that are going to hip you to the stuff, you're not going to really know what to listen to per se. There's so much out there. And then on top of that, I also feel like if you're only getting on the bandstand a handful of times a month, uh, you're not going to get comfortable developing your own individual sound. I mean, let's face it. I mean, you were playing some upholstered sewers in the upstate circuit, upstate New York circuit. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't, the, I mean, I mean, going back to like the Grateful Dead, they were playing out of the PA. I mean, you had horrible yeah, yeah. sonic systems. You know, maybe yeah, the bass yeah. wasn't even amplified. So over time... Yeah. You're like, okay, I'm cool. Like, I, I love Mickey Roker. I, I love Tony. These, But you know what? Yeah. Like, I got to come up with my own stuff because I can't hear anybody. Yeah. You know I mean? just So, I mean, yeah. it's – it's, and then it just comes down to also this this idea of saying, well, I mean, this is a whole other topic. But, you know, there's there's this whole mentality of saying, well, I mean, how much can you br- – how many people can you bring in the door? Well, if you're a no-name act yeah. – what how you you know you can pay to play or you can play for the yeah, door yeah. and then also the, yeah. the the thing that irks me the most which is one reason I love groups like Soul Live one thing that's bothering me now is is the lack of authenticity in pop music uh, in the sense that you can mm-hmm. have a singer and she'll say how did I sound and the engineer will say terrible but we can fix it and because they have thirty yeah, million Twitter yeah. followers. They're a pop star, yeah. and that's sending yeah. a terrible yeah. message as it relates to authenticity. Authenticity yeah. is what we've been yeah. talking about this whole time. So I got another – listen, you can mull on this stuff. I got another audio clip for you. I want you to listen to the content, right. and then we'll uh, we'll break it down. Cool. I worked with Mr. Silver. Uh, they were, it was, I experienced my first out-of-body experience where I actually left my body on the bandstand, sat down in the audience, and watched me and the band play, and it scared me half to death. I didn't even understand. We were work. We had come, come to a point that, that I, I never knew before. We were playing so in sync that it was all as if we were in slow motion, but I heard every note and everything worked perfectly for me. And I understood that this is a this something like this doesn't come every day, or every maybe maybe it might only happen once in my life. Although I have now experienced it more than once in my life, more than twice in my life, but it has been on specific occasions. And I, I have to tell you, man, it's it's the most there are, there is no. There is no reward. There is no Oscar for this except to be able to sit there and go, wow, that's amazing. I never knew the band could sound like this. And again, it's the band. Not Horace. Not the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Not the Billy Cobham Band. Just the band. I think you're going to know who that is. I do. I Actually, I know that. I've heard that. Why is it driving me crazy? Well, no, it's, it's Billy Cobham. That was from my interview with Billy. Billy. Cobham. Yeah, that was yeah. my my interview with Billy from April 2015. And one thing yeah, that, man. Yeah. yeah, and this is a cat like Lenny White, never uh-huh. did, which is very cool. 
they never did any drugs in their life. Sober as all get mm-hmm. out. And here are these. Ca- and this is what I wanted to talk to Alan Evans about because this is where the Jake Feinberg show meet, the rubber meets the road. Is there's only two letters that separate magic and music, and mm-hmm. and I want you to talk about. Um, a, a time in your career where you actually left your physical he was talking about leaving his physical body he was playing yeah. with Brecker and Benny Maupin and 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 then there was another gig with the Mahavishnu Orchestra that had to do with fatigue he was so physically tired and he wound up seeing himself on the side of the stage watching him play drums and I just yeah, wanted you yeah, to yeah. I wanted you to talk about that metaphysical experience of leaving your physical body as it relates to the band yeah, I mean, to to be honest, that happens to me a lot. I know, I know it does. N- no, really, man, especially um, when we're doing Bowl Live. Um, <laughs> because there's something really interesting about Bowl Live um, in that, you know, we put a lot, of, it's, a, it's a lot of hard work. You know, you get, get to the, you know, to the Brooklyn Bowl early in the, in the morning or whatever, late morning, early afternoon, and then you're rehearsing with, you know, whoever's on that night. And we rehearsed basically up until, you know, doors were hanging out and then you eat a little food, then all of a sudden you're on stage. And and we do that for, you know, two weeks. And and it gets to a point where, um, and I I find this the same as when I'm writing music in the studio, um, you get to a point where you're, you're kind you're tired, you know, you're physically, you know, it's, it's, it's draining playing that much music, but you get to these points where, you um you're you're able to just shut like some part of you just shuts down and and you're um you're open to what's happening in in the universe you know thing it just comes and then all of a sudden you're not tired anymore you're just you're like on cruise control it's it's literally like an out of body experience and and that's some of my best playing and i love being able to get to that point, you know, and I, I, um, I guess that's kind of like the, it's, you know, it's what people are usually chasing is to be able to get to there. And some people are able to just get there immediately, you know, when I, at, at will, you know, and, and, uh, but I know when it's coming, I can feel it, you know, and, and then you just, you just let go and let it happen. I mean, it just happened to me the other night down in New Orleans, I was on a gig and, um, just we got into this groove and and it's like the it's like a frequency thing. You just tap into tap into this frequency. Everything on stage is is just clicking and and then you're just you're just on autopilot. It's just you know like you're there but you're not there at all. Um, exactly. The, it is the most amazing. It's the most amazing feeling a, a, ever. You know and and. and it, uh, there's nothing else like it. There really isn't. There really isn't. You can you can do no wrong at that point. You, well, that, I mean, you just you can't. I mean, can you can you talk to to the peeps worldwide about uh, how special operating on that frequency is and how long it can play out? I mean, you talked about uh, playing with guys that you love at uh, you mm-hmm. know at the bowl. Or, I mean, I think that has a yeah. lot to do with it too. I mean, you know, you. you you talk to cats, and that's another issue going on today. Is you got, you know, everyone's playing it safe. You know, you got Journey going out for you know million dollar summer tours. That you know, some cats yeah. they don't even they go out and they hate their they each other's guts, but they do it because they make a lot yeah. of money. Part of it is also just loving the people on the bandstand and being able to be yourself. Yeah. But can you talk yeah. that's yeah. that freak how special that frequency is, especially because, I mean, for some people they can go there immediately but for most people most yeah. cats like billy was saying he goes mm-hmm. i had to stop and realize that this may never happen again oh yeah without a doubt man i i i'm conscious of that all the time mm-hmm. i mean it's it's a special feeling and you may never like you just never know you never know um but that's what i but that's what keeps <laughs> it's, yeah, and it's very similar to a, a drug, I guess. You know, it keeps you coming back for more. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's addictive. Yeah, you're just, yeah. Con- you're just yeah, you're, it's super addictive. You're chasing it all the time. That that feeling, you know, it's it's a great thing. I think that's what keeps you know 
keeps us moving, you know, keeps, you know, keeps the music moving, keeps us, you know, wanting in front of people. And, and it's just, I think the thing is, it's a lot more than just the musicians on stage. You know, it's like, it's a combination of everything. It's the vibe in the room. It's what people, it's the energy that, that everyone, every single person there brings, brings to it, you know? Um, and I'm, again, that's, that's probably why some, you know, people are on, in the Grateful Dead and, you know, like, True, there's like a, a certain, you know, there's always been a certain, um, you know, drug culture associated with the dead. But I, 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 but I also tend to believe that it, it's more than that. You know, what I mean, like that's just, I don't know. To me, that's just kind of like a side side story to the whole thing. I mean, it, people, you know, it's it's about. And I'm not. I, 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 I admit, I'm not the, the biggest dead fan at all. You know, sure. But I can rec. I recognize. I, I recognize the greatness, you know, in those cats and, 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 in that whole community, you know, that whole, that whole thing, you know, like it's, that's magic. You know what I mean? Like every, you know, and, and, and um, I love it. I love what you're doing. Was, no, you're hundred. Listen, I, this is the, 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 as we got, we just burned through set one. I really want to do set two with you uh, and it, very soon. But the, the, the thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, when you go in the studio with Kraz now and your brother, uh, mm -hmm. is the reason you don't go in with any plan is to access that certain frequency, even in the studio. Exactly, exactly, exactly. There's there's something about like, right? If you're if you're too like over overly prepared and you know what you're gonna do, like sometimes I, I really feel that like you're you are you're just closing the door <laughs> to to the to to those possibilities of what could, you know, so yeah, I, 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 that's why I love, we come in the studio and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's like, but we just start playing and, and again, it comes back to trust. You know, we're, we just trust each other. We trust that we're, we are going to create something. Something is going, I, 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 I I'm not even going to say we are going to create something. Something is going to be created. You know, something, it, it, it's already, like, you know what? It's already been created, and that's the thing. It's pre pre it's like, preordained or something. It's, it's it's all all the music. It's it's already out there. Wow! It's all the songs. They're already out there. It's just a matter of you being in tune, tune enough, or being in tune to 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 accept it and translate it uh, for you know through your instrument or through your voice for everyone to hear. Um, and I, I truly believe that there, there's, it's just, they're, they're already there. You just have to be ready. You just have to be ready for it. Um, so, and there's a lot of cats who are, again, I'm a huge Zappa fan. He's probably one of the greatest, um, examples of that. I mean, his body of work is, is, is so mind boggling. This is stuff that we've heard as you know audi as the audience you did know, you say zappa people. you said frank zappa zappa oh definitely yeah, oh zappa. well yeah absolutely now, there's, there's vaults of stuff that that no one has heard yet and and so you can i you know you can't tell me that i mean I, i'm not trying to take anything away from his greatness as a as a as an artist but that dude was it, his the greatness to, to me was he was just and he was tapped in you know, like, yeah, sure, he had the time to, to do all, you know, put in, but he was tapped into something. Very deep. That kind of, yeah, I mean, and he was fusing. You know? Well, he was, yeah, and I hate to use genres, but anytime you're fusing two yeah. types of music symphonically, you know, you know he was taking rock oh. music and then just orchestra. It's everything. I mean, you know, even, even Zappa, I mean, I just... I do a lot of Facebook live interviews. I went to go see the great percussionist, Emil Richards. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's talking about the first time that Frank was in the studio on his first album. He was an yeah. unknown. And these mm -hmm. like, these like snobbish sort of horn players were like, well, we, we can't play this, uh, th these charts. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and then Frank's like, well, if I, if I play it on my guitar, then will you try to play it on your, on your horns? And he did it. Exactly. And then, like Tommy Tedesco, the original Wrecking Crew guys, like looked at the horn players. He's yeah. like, he's like, guys, come on. He's like, this guy's not screwing around. He knows what he's doing. He, he, he had to prove yeah. himself too. It's just, I think, 
we're in a very we're in a formula trip, Alan, right now, which yeah. is like really bothering me. I don't I don't get off on that, and mm-hmm. and and I want uh, and I just you guys are clearly the links in the chain <clears throat> between uh, the old guard and the, and the new cats, mm-hmm. and I think it's a huge and responsibility, and it's also a great honor to be able to be mm-hmm. in this position. And I you know. One thing I wanted to ask you, though, before I let you go, mm-hmm. how, what's your advice to, to, I mean, this is really hard because Soul Live has been burning for a lo- how many years? What, 20 years? Or? Almost 20. Yeah. So, I 20. mean, you guys yep. are an established brand. You've been on different labels. I mean, mm-hmm. you are, you are defying the current trend. You're on tour. Um, you know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're touring prolifically. You're able to basically take the old, old, you know, sort of, you know, way of doing, you know, you'd make an album and you can promote the album by touring. But a lot of cats mm-hmm. now, they just record. And those albums yeah. wind up sitting on the shelf and they don't breathe. They don't get any, they can't get out on. The, how, how do you get into the live touring circuit today? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I wish I, I really wish I had a, a, a real, a good answer. Um, well, maybe because, the better question uh, is how did you guys start? How did, what was the break that you got to get out into? I mean, you're going, I'm looking here, you got, you know, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and then you're going to mm-hmm. United Kingdom. But how did you guys yeah. start back to almost 20 years ago? How did you get into the touring circuit? Maybe that'll, maybe it hasn't changed that much. Well, I mean, honestly, Neil and I were doing it before Soul Live, so we already we had, you know. There you go. I mean, you know, we were touring with our old band with like Aquarium Rescue Unit and different, you know, like cats like that, you know. So we kind of already established ourselves as really young cats, you know. Um, I guess we've been we put in a lot of hard work and we've been lucky, you know. It, um, so these days. I mean, it's, I mean, back in the day, there were just like a lot of promoters who were like into music and, oh, cool. We never heard of you, but we dig your, you know, your, your sound. I think it'll work on this night, you know, or with this band or, um, and now it seems like, you know, a lot of cats are trying to get on festivals. And the first thing people will do is go to your Facebook page and see how many, you know, followers exactly. or likes you have. Right, man. I mean, it has I mean, nothing I mean, to like, do with taking chances. People took chances on you because it, the vibe was there. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, so, this with more that a, said, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's tough. It's it's. There's no doubt about it. It's tough. But the thing is, I I I still, I I mean, I may be, I don't know. I I really feel that like if if you're creating something, it, it's in the coming from the right place, you know. And 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 if it's good, people will pay attention. I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm trying to simplify it too too much, or. Um, well, I I, my, I guess my only concern is that, uh, I, I think that, that when you guys started, what you just said, you had promoters that said, "Man, these guys are this is a, this is a cool look. The instrumentation's good. The music has a groove, yeah. and you know they don't they don't necessarily have a huge following, but." I'm going to take a chance. That's everything's playing yeah. it safe now. You know, that to me is the, yeah, it's a very yeah. corporate mindset. Now people will always say the cream rises to the top, but with that lack of authenticity yeah. that we talked about, um, either way, it's like, I, I tip my cap to you guys that you're able to make all, a new album and it doesn't just mm-hmm. sit and gather dust or cobwebs that it right. actually gets a chance to breathe. And maybe you get mm-hmm. out there and, and, uh, and you never play the same song once, you know. It always is different. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I mean, I, I mean, we have, uh, yeah. I mean, that's 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 nice. We have everybody to thank for that, you know. The people who dig what we do, you know. What I mean, like, yeah, it's, I, I'd like to think that. Oh, well, we went in the studio all these years and we're making really good music. I'm proud of what we've done, you know. But I mean, you're you're, you're you're nobody unless you're connecting with people, you know? Exactly. So, I mean, um, so I, I guess that's the thing. I, I, I have young, I mean, I'm in my studio today. I have a band in here. Um, and, and I just had a, a band in a few days ago asking me the same question, you know, it's like, 
um, you know, what what can we do to? It's like, man, just um, it's tough, but it's not it's not impossible. It's not impossible. I mean, it was tough. It was hard when we when when I was starting off when I was like, you know, young teenager. You know, there was there were plenty of people who were telling me no, um, but it's it's uh, but I figured out I figured out how it worked. You know, I'm I'm still trying to figure out how it works, but and um, a lot of it also, man, is just a numbers game. I tell that's one thing I tell people all the time. It's like, you know, so I, there's been many times where so I could have just said, "Oh, screw it," you know, it's too hard, or you know, like it's just, you know, yeah, we're playing to three people. What out. are we doing? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah. totally. Yeah. And we could have just called it a day, and no one would no one would have ever heard of us, you know. But it's the people who stay. It's you know, it, 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 it the, if you just stick it out, you know. There's I've I've known so many great bands, musicians who just man, if they would have just another six months, you know, <laughs> man, they would have been. You know what I mean? Like, no, I dig, man. I uh, dig it, man. I you dude, know. you are. I mean, you are the salvation, uh, uh, the soul and salvation, and um, uh, yeah, man. Listen, also. Uh, so I'll, I'll get you a copy of this later, but you, you got to find some room. I, I, I sent you a friend request on Facebook, so make sure you friend me because okay. I, I disseminate a lot of these stories and they're inspiring uh, and they bounce awesome. all. And uh, I wish you, uh, uh, are you, are you coming anywhere near the Southwest? I mean, I'm based out of Tucson. I'd love to come and catch a hang, even in New Mexico or somewhere. Uh, yeah, not that I know of off the top of my head, yeah. but um, but I, uh, I'll well, maybe sure maybe, maybe we know. can just get maybe we can just get Kofi O'Teal and you and your brother down here for a gig in Tucson. That would that would make my life, I think, at that point. Oh boy, that, <laughs> yeah, that would be something else. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Alan Evans, it was a I had a ball, man. Thank you, and best of luck on the tour. And then let's uh, let's do part two sometime in the spring, uh, or you know before the the summer. Man, anytime. I'm. I'm. Thank you so much. This has been great. This really has. It's ama- amazing. Yeah. So thank well, that you. welcome and to the Jake Feinberg show. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Be good. You too, man. Cheers. Later. Yeah. Bye. Gifted drummer and uh, equally gifted human being, Alan Evans, uh, had a ball. Thank you to Kevin Calibro and the Royal Potato family. Uh, and we'll be back uh, this weekend with. Um, uh, Uh, Just a whole array of other musicians. Until then, this is the Jake Feinberg Show. Peace.